Okay, um, we'd better get this um, on the road. Now, I seem to be doing something very exciting and I'm broadcasting an actual hangout on air. So, um, it will be available publicly at the moment. It's pointed that way, so don't like make any comments. You don't want. To. Some people wanted to see it who couldn't make it tonight, so we're giving that a go. Um, <coughs> there is no one watching us at the moment, so <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see how that happens. Um, it, does anyone have any real objection to that? No. Okay. Good. Um, <laughs> So um, our speaker today is my brother here, James. Um, he'll be talking about starting a web app from scratch and doing continuous integration and things it's exciting like that. How did you put it, James? Definitely starting. <laughs> <laughs> ah. And um, what we usually do here is we just do a quick round of introductions. Um, I actually did take your answers to the last question about um, what you wanted to hear, um, and I gave it to James, and um, we've got it up um, so we can we can have a look on what future people wanted to hear. Um, so I guess we'll just do another round of what can you present, um, hopefully so that people come up to me and go, actually, I do want to present that. Hi, um, my name's Stu Mitchell. Um, I work. Um, I do. Consulting, and I am um, um, basically in optimization, um, uh, linear programming, etc., and so on. Um, I would like to do a presentation on how to use ClojureScript because I'm doing that to the ClojureScript group um, probably next month. My name is Philip, and if I was going to do a presentation, it would probably be on Cypher. Well, my name is uh, Maurice. Um, I haven't got any idea for presentation yet, but uh, it's my first time here. Um, I started at Spark this week, and I'll probably uh, after a couple of months I'll be able to have some ideas for presenting. My name is Sharif. Uh, I am relatively new to Python, so I have no idea what to present here. Uh, hopefully, this will be done in a few months' time. <coughs> um, I'm Nathan. Um, I'm Python developer at HTML in the Yellow Pages. And uh, there's a couple of things that I'm interested about and uh, potentially could present here in the future, not in the very near future, but sometime in the future. I'm interested about GeoJank. Uh, and GeoJank. GeoJank. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have used it briefly at work, and uh, I think you can do some interesting things with it. I'm also interested about Elasticsearch, uh, running um, search engine that's performing search uh, using Elasticsearch using Python API for Elasticsearch. Might might make a bit some fun. I'm Paul. I'm also a relative beginner to Python, at least in terms of experience, not in terms of the amount of time that I've known it. I've scratched the surface quite some time ago. Um, I asked last week about uh, presentation and about um, potentially distribution of Python apps and things to end users. I um, have been doing quite a bit of research on that recently, so that would be tricks and potentially have some time to present on at some point. It's really fine if all your end users use Linux. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Packaging for Windows. Um, my name is Graham. Um, I've been working with um, Flask in, in a commercial sense. I never had a chance to work with uh, Django, although I spent a lot of time learning up on it. So I found that um, Flask was able to produce very quick proof of concept kind of um, ideas that's based on you know, round table discussions rather than detailed specifications enough to get users buy in quite quickly. So 
only presentation I did probably be a either a comparison of fast and getting up or just a, a good way to use fast to press digital transfer. <laughs> Yeah, my name is Mark Reznell. Um, I run a small uh, software company called Convergence Limited. Um, we used to be very heavily involved with, with IBM um, across their entire portfolio. Started off in the Lotus camp uh, many, many years ago. We've been, been, been in business since uh, for 19 years now. Um, more recently, we, we got into Python through a couple of our developers who started building um, what we now call e-commerce website integration solutions. So basically closing the gap between uh, people's e-commerce websites and their back office ERP or accounting systems, just synchronizing the data. And for a lot of custom systems out there, there's really no off-the-shelf solution. It's quite a challenge for those companies to get that to work. So we uh, engage with them with a consulting um, package to start and understand their requirements and build a, a custom integration that uses a core um, engine that we've built around Python. So if I were to present something, I'd get one of my developers in to do that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking to uh, expand our team. So that's really my primary objective here to be guys who might be looking for some extra work. Um, we're growing it and we need some extra coders in there. My name is Roland Eskew. I'm sort of more, um, more of a Python enthusiast. If I did a presentation, I'd be curious about doing one on computer algebra system, possibly Synthi, or maybe SageMan, both of which I've seen in the past. Go Sage. Um, I'm Doug. Uh, I'm just one of the colleagues. Um, I'm a master's student, and I'll do something that probably the Something about one of the ways that the Python based open source controller is getting that stuff. My master student is where and doing what? Uh, at Bitcoin. 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 I'm working in a biomedical company in Macau. So uh, I'm new to Python. I don't have any experience, but we're working with Android, C Sharp, many other languages. So, uh, one of my recent projects is a patient management system. So, but I developed it in PHP. I think maybe Python could be better <laughs> choice for this. So, and uh, also I'm working, uh, I'm a uh, Raspberry Pi enthusiast at home. So, I think uh, of making some sort of like a step motor controller with Raspberry Pi. There's a lot of people who want to see usage <laughs> of Python to drive the motors. Hi, my name is Justin. I'm a university student in 3D animation. If I were to present, I'll probably uh, use Python to read the uh, micro Hi, I'm if I want to present it, like, you know, I'm interested in this very much. So maybe uh, interaction, uh, how will that be? Uh, like. Hi, my name's Graham. Uh, I've just been using uh, Fabric for the last, uh, since the presentation I made last uh, month, uh, to uh, deploy uh, on my website and uh, to do backups and stuff. So I guess I can talk about Fabric. It's a good tool written in Python, which you probably might be talking about. I don't know. But <laughs> uh, you can use, use it to sort of simplify command line stuff. And um, I enjoyed using it. So. Right. Hello, I'm Don. Um, well, I'm a Python. Uh, and um, I haven't done anything in relation to the web. So I've eaten a knife. I have a bit about that. I'm Rick. Um, 
they have not hate with Python experience, certainly don't do it for a living. If I were going to present, it would have to be something geospatial, um, maybe getting into GDAL and other and that sort of stuff. Um, oh, I don't know. Be something spatial. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm less than China. Student just studying geography at the Open Unit. Um, my focus is on the image analysis and processing using Python. And uh, um, I'm using satellite images to study carbon seals in Auckland. Maybe in the future I can show you my research progress. <laughs> well, we would, we would love to do that. Like, it would be great training if you ever have to do like a seminar or something to us as well. Mm -hmm. You can take the lab slide. <laughs> my name is Alex, and I like Python programming in it for work and enjoy that. If I were to give a talk, I think I would go do something geospatial as well. I was thinking maybe uh, geo pandas, which I've just been getting into, which is a combination of pandas and um, Shapely for geo processing. It's pretty cool. Um, also, I'd like to add to that just a quick two job pitches for anybody interested as well. It seems like um, oh, Do you want to do that to the, to the Hangout person as well? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> So uh, the company, I, well, first of all, I know I know a guy, a um, lecturer at the University of Auckland, who has some grant money to do some scientific programming. He's got to use it. Um, he's got a little bit every year, I think, for small scientific programming projects. He's in the computer science department, and his interests lie around um, uh, network analysis, like like math like graphs and mathematical networks, not um, not like networking as in computer science. And and also maybe voting theory and stuff. So if you're in, if you're interested in, in little scientific projects um, in collaboration with the University of Auckland, just let me know. I can put you in contact with him. Uh, I bring that just because I had lunch with him a few days ago. But also my company, MR Cagney the company I work for is also on the lookout for for one or two people. Um, MR Cagney is a transport, public transport and planning consultancy, and we do a lot of data analysis and visualization projects for mostly public transport companies like Auckland Transport or TransLink in Brisbane, mostly New Zealand and Australia, though we, we have done some stuff with people in Europe too, and in the U.S. And what we're looking for, we're getting we're getting pretty busy, so we're looking to expand our team at least in an overflow capacity, or like on a project to project basis, and which could lead to a permanent contract. Um, and we're looking for a web developer and a scientific developer that could be the same person um, to do uh, web app stuff that's in like the visualization side of things and to do analytical stuff, data analysis, that's sort of the scientific programming side of things. Like I said, it could be the same person. But we're looking for somebody with several years' experience in Python and the relevant area, like data analysis or data visualization, making web apps, that sort of thing. So if uh, either of those opportunities appeal to you, let me know, and uh, we can talk about it more afterwards. Thanks. All right. Oh, uh, my name's James. I'll prove that with this slide. Uh, so we've got a request, so make sure you speak loudly. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll take the lights. First and last use of color in the entire presentation. <laughs> um, 
So my name's James, James Mitchell. I am a underutilized uh, Python developer. Uh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's all so I want to talk to you, I want to talk to you, everybody. Um, for the last uh, many years, it's been Python. Uh, I spent a good uh, year or two doing PHP before that, and before that, Perl. So basically, it starts with P, I developed with it. Um, almost entirely on internet basis stuff recent, uh, since 2002. So uh, the guy who wanted to know how to start a desktop Python application, this talk is not for you. This talk is all about web apps so that I can sidestep packaging. Yeah. No idea how to package, so I just do it on the web. And I'm going to sidestep that whole which UI am I going to use? I'm going to use HTML. That's my UI. That's all I care about. Said, uh, he gave me this list of uh, what everybody wanted to hear. And I resonated with only the one that said, I want to know how to start a Python um, application. And I said, well, OK, so it'd be quite good if I said, here's, here's a thing that I've been wanting to do for quite some time. Um, let's actually start that. This talk has got almost no in it because this really is starting the application. What's the bag of tricks and tools that you're going to throw at the body and then actually say, right, now how do I bring that together into my application? The life cycle of a project, I'm calling it. So this is talk one. Things that we're going to do before we actually get around to writing any code. Sort of things. Got to find out what the requirements are. What, does, what do we actually want to achieve? We're going to write down those tasks. I'm trying to be relatively generic here. But uh, once you know what you want to do, you should write them down. Because if you're anything like me, you'll forget what you wanted to do next week, and you'll have a whole new project. Because it's nothing like what you wanted to do to start with. We're going to set up some tools, some services. They're all going to be on the cloud, so look out for that. It's going to be exciting. And then we're going to settle back and do some heavy, heavy thinking, possibly with our eyes closed. Um, the sort of things we're looking at here is we're going to end up starting a Django app. It's going to be Django. That's what I do. We're going to be kind of taking some of that um, agile sprint mythology. That's what I mean when I say I'm going to write down tasks and plump them together into what we can achieve. Um, and when I say we, I mean me, I guess. I guess there's a possibility of collaboration, but um, I have no idea how that would work. Uh, and then towards the end, well, we're going to deploy this thing out into the, into the network. Um, I'm going to go for the, the sexy hotness of continuous integration. We're going to go for something that is hands-off deployments. I just want to commit code, and I want to see a website happen. So the pre-production is, is a going to mutilate movie terminology all the way through this talk. This is the pre-production of getting our web app up and going. This app is all about my short-term memory failing. I see trailers for movies. People tell me about a movie that's been made of my favorite book. And in six months' time, I'm surprised that I just missed it at the cinema. It's gone. I have no idea that it came out. So I want some way of saying a tool that's going to remind me when the movies that I'm actually interested in are released either to the cinema, have come out on DVD because I've failed to get to the cinema to see them. Conversely, I may not want to own it, so I want to know if it's on DVD, it's probably for rental. <coughs> if it's a good movie, you don't want overnight rental, so I want to know that it's roughly when it's come out for weekly rental. It's got lots of commentaries. You know, I'm not going to stay up for six hours watching the movie over and over just to get the different commentaries going. So let's break that down. Those are the requirements. That's information gathering right there. So what did I actually hear when I spoke to myself just then? I heard the words remind me. So this web app needs to know about a thing called me. So we're going to call that the users. It's going to have some users. We're going to have to register with it. It's going to have to know who I am and how to get in touch with me. 
and there's going to be this regular process that checks stuff and somehow or another reminds me. So that, those are the first two requirements that we want this to have. Movies that I'm interested in. So there's that concept of movies now. Yay, another database table. Um, I don't know if this is old fashioned or not, but I'm very much a database centric man. So I tend to grow applications from the data, from the database out. What do I need to store? How am I going to get it out? And maybe it'll end up on a screen somewhere looking like spaghetti or possibly pretty spaghetti. Um, so, and, uh, so we have that concept of the users. Now we've got a concept of a movie. And there's a linkage together, which I'm going to call a wish list. Then I want to know when they're released to cinemas, DVDs, rentals. Now, luckily, because this is the really hard part, there are actually services out there that we can query. There are things like the Rotten Tomatoes database as an API that we can just call and say, here's a movie, when did it come out? Ditto something called the movie database. Apparently, also called Netflix and find out when I can stream this movie. So that's nice. Um, the one I've gone for is a thing called the Open Movie Database, just because uh, it had very, very unrestrictive um, registration requirements. I didn't have to pay them anything. And it doesn't look like I even have to register with them to get an API key. I can just send queries out. So that's those are the requirements. Pull out to extreme wide shot. What does this thing look like? Not in great detail, but what does it kind? What do we kind of see? We should be seeing a responsive mobile web app. We're going to use that <laughs> for all the interactions. It's going to search for movies. It's where we authenticate. It's going to look great on the phone. It's going to be on the on the web. The web app will also. Um, it's not going to talk to our back end. I want it to talk directly to the service to do searches so that our back end only deals with registering a wish list. And I want to do that so that I just don't end up having all the traffic going through my back end. I want thousands of front end interfaces all making their separate queries to the service, not all making a query to my service. <laughs> ramping up my CPU utilization so I have to pay Amazon even more and I proxy all the requests out. Make sense? Yeah. Um, that back end API just storing the wish list. So it should have very low utilization. It should just have people every now and then saying I'm interested in this movie. Um, and then it has that regular job going through checking, checking the wish list seeing whether or not anything's changed about the release dates, sending out emails. And I want that continuous integration, automatic deployment. Has anybody here actually logged onto a server, pulled code over, updated that production system, done some sort of a migration? One, <laughs> several, yay. So I don't want to do that. I want the... Um, the, the thing that you've got with things like Heroku, things that you've got with some of these other services uh, where they look at your code and know that you've made a change to that code and magic happens, they deploy. App Engine does that as well. And App Engine. Uh, I've done, looking at my notes, I think I even get to name check that App Engine oh. really soon. <laughs> and I went to the AWS Summit uh, last week Guess what? AWS has even got this deployment pipeline. How many places can I deploy one simple web app that I'm the only person who's ever going to use? Three so far. Three places. Um, and we want the development <coughs> process to actually do some tracking of work done and that's yet to do. Um, uh, that's, that's just I'm putting a little veneer of professionalism over it. So that we, we track stuff. So what are the givens? Macro detail. We're at a Python talk, so Python's going to be a given. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wish that wasn't the only time you're going to see the word Python. <laughs> um, we have to have a version control system. You have to have a version control system. 
you have to have a go. I, I was really surprised. Amazon Summit, there's a guy in the main stage, and he's saying, does anybody here not use version control? And I swear he actually saw a couple of hands go up because he, he started to scan. it. <laughs> so I didn't realize this was a uh, you know something you might not do, but um, even if it, even if just your naughty scripts that you have on your 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 home directory, you know, my naughty scripts do things like um, uh, convert video files between formats, and you just stick that in a little version control. It doesn't have to go up to the cloud. You can have uh, run get with Azar on your local directory. But you know, when you break something, it's really awful to try and figure out what you broke without just saying, just tell me the difference as well. Oh, of course I did that. Um, it's going to be a web-based app, and it's going to be a Django. Django, because I know it. Flask scares me. Um, and I think the main difference here is actually that because I'm database-centric and Django Django forces me to have that ORM level. It's forcing me to make my database. It's in my comfort zone. That's where I want to be. Whereas I suspect if I went the Flask route, I've got to start making choices about what database uh, ORM framework to actually use. I'm not into choices. I just want to take that thing that it gives me and make it work. And we're going to deploy into the cloud. We're going to deploy onto Google App Engine and or Heroku, and or one of the Cloud Foundry um, uh, derivatives. I quite like Staccato, mostly because they give you a machine image that you can bring up in the um, EC2 instance, so there's very little configuration to be done. <coughs> Why would I want three of those? Because we can mimic a kind of a professional thing where I can automatically deploy a test version to one infrastructure, let's say Google App Engine, and when I'm happy with that, push the code off to the master branch that I'm going to use and have that automatically deploy to the other one, Heroku, whatever. You wouldn't do that in a real environment because you want to keep them identical, but since we're doing this for, for lols, um, we're going to go and deploy into all sorts of different places. And don't, is this more or less acceptable than PHP? <laughs> JavaScript, AngularJS. So the, the UI is not actually going to be served out of um, Django. It's going to be actually be a separate little code base in Angular just to put an HTML interface on, let you do a search, and then pop back in. JavaScript scales really well. Yeah, because of that. Um, I did some work with this uh, at a, uh, a previous company, with and um, I, I, we, we kind, I kind of got halfway through. I wasn't quite even comfortable. No, it had back there. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I was wrong. I can't tell the difference between you, but you're in the same room. Sorry. Um, and so this one, instead of trying to serve my Angular out of the Django infrastructure and tying it, I, I felt slightly uncomfortable about that. So I'm going to try this one as a completely two separate projects, the Angular completely separated from the Django, and then using some sort of a, uh, a linkage to tell Angular where I keep my Django. It should give you a bit of freedom, because that means that you could actually end up having a completely stable Django thing, which you never have to deploy again, and just keep pushing out your UI with changes. Or it might not work. We'll see in a couple of months' time. So pulling back out, slightly medium shot, what are we looking at? We have the version control, uh, everyone's favorite GitHub out in the cloud. So you, yes, you do all your work locally but you push it out to GitHub. And the reason GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab or did anybody notice Launchpad, Canonical's Bazaar now supports Git natively. You could use Launchpad to hold you. Especially if you just like doing things that are crazy. Um, so if it's in the cloud, you get to use these web hooks. You get to integrate services together which can talk to each other without having to come through a firewall and talk to your laptop, which is never going to happen. <coughs> and 
The kind of thing you want is an automatic testing service. Uh, I went for Travis CI, and the popular one is Jenkins, you may know about. And somebody mentioned Bamboo at my favorite AWS summit last week, so I threw it on the slide. Basically, it connects to GitHub or whatever. When your code goes up and changes, an alert gets sent through their internal APIs to this guy's internal API. He pulls your copy of the code out, builds it all, and starts running those tests. Now, we're going to write tests, so that's, that's a good thing. If those tests work, you get a nice little badge turn up saying your tests passed. And you just make sure that's no, there's a better reason. If your tests work and you had pushed this up into the cloud in the first place, you must want it deployed to a website. You would, wouldn't you? It's obvious. Otherwise, why would you have pushed it? So this thing's just built your code. You get it to also push that code that it just built out onto the um, Google App Engine or onto Heroku. You bind that together, and then you never have to think about it again. Now, in particular with Travis, you can get it to only do this for your master branch, if you're thinking you're worried, because you can have a development branch where it doesn't deploy in a, in a master where it does. Yeah. What about like little, you know, little scripts you have to do on deployment, like you know, collect static and stuff on the server? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, well, I will try and show you that in the 3-4 uh, bit where the presentation sort of grows and expands uh, terribly. But uh, Travis works by requiring you to have a YAML file in your repository, mm -hmm. which defines what it should actually do. And that has the, the typical before running, after running. And that, those are the places where you put your deployments mm -hmm. and before deployment on, the after deployment. Okay, and nice. yes, that's, that, that's where I was, I was um, planning to put um, little checks that say, um, for the release to test branch, release this one to the test environment or production. And then on the actual release branch that's allowed to go to production, then we deploy it. So that, that's where you put more code. Uh, I forget what the exact terminology is, but the idea is that you stop logging in and typing commands that you may mistype one day. You type everything in as a configuration to Travis or write a script with Fabric, and you get that thing to do the same job every time, and you just never have to touch it. Um, code coverage. Oh, yeah, I also found a, uh, a, do you know what code coverage is? I'm assuming knowledge of people with tests, running tests on your code. OK, quickly. Have you ever typed Python on a command line got the little prompt and said, right now, I think I do this to get the information out of the yada yada and just try something. Yes, a couple of nods. Yeah. I like to think of that as my